All right, it's good to be back. I, uh, many of you know I had a type of heart surgery a few weeks ago. It's called mitral valve surgery. It was not blockage. It's something I was born with. And the doctor went in there, opened me up, and fixed it. And I've been in recovery the last several weeks. And I really appreciate all of your prayers and well wishes. It really, really means a lot. I've entitled today's message, You Were Made for This. You were made for this. That's a pretty big statement. And it begs the question, well, what was I made for? We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But let's start off by talking about probably one of the most successful and well-known musicals of all time called Les Mis, Les Miserables. We all know it's a story about a guy who was kind of suffering some serious injustice. His name is Jean Valjean. And when the, open, the opening scene, we find him that's in a prison and he is with his fellow prisoners and they're pulling this massive rope-like chain and it's a very dark and dreary situation and they're singing this song that says, don't look them in the eye, look down, look down, you're here until you die. And they just pound that phrase, they pound that chorus over and over again to look down, to look down, to look down. Don't look at your captors. Don't look at the guards. Look down. You are in a hopeless, defeated situation. I know that many times life can beat us down. It can beat you down to the ground. And some of us walked into the worship center today, though you're not physically looking down, but you are looking down inside. You're looking down. You feel heavy. You feel burdened. You feel defeated. But you know, and I know, that you were not made to look down. Others of us are not looking down, we're looking at. We're looking at. We, we live in a time where we're just constantly called to look at others, to look at what they have, to look at where they live, to look how they vacation. And we are constantly called to compare ourselves to other people to see where they are so we can feel like this is where we are. And we know so many studies already have been come out of as far as social media and the so-called smartphones and how that addiction leads to depression and feelings of hopelessness and despair when we're constantly called to look at. Others of us are looking in. We're looking in. We're trying to find some sense of meaning in life by looking in. Or we're trying to put something in our bodies that will make us feel different. We're trying to put something in our bodies that will cause us to escape. So as we gather here in this July summer, this hot, humid Houston summer, some of us are looking down. Some of us are looking at. Some of us are looking in. But this is not what we're made for. Let's do this. Let's open God's Word, the Bible, and see what He has to say to you and to say to me for what we're made for. Turn to the very middle of the Bible, the book of Psalm, Psalm 100. Psalm 100, check it out. Verse one following says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him 
with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Check it out. For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 100. The great novelist Stephen King described a book in this way. He said that a book is a piece of portable magic. And I like that definition of a book because I'm kind of old school and I like books. I like to read and to carry them with me because it can take me and transport me into a different time and a different place. Books truly are a piece of portable magic. And when I read Psalm 100, and I've read it many times, like many of you have, I'm constantly reminded that it is a piece of portable magic. Why? Look at what it does. First of all, Psalm 100 takes us to a higher place. It takes us to a higher place. Psalm 100 also gives us an ultimate perspective. And Psalm 100 gives us a transcendent purpose. It gives us a clue. It really tells us, if you would, what we're made for. Basically, in a sentence, in a soundbite, you were made to joyfully worship your creator. That's why you were made. You can clap for that. Not just a golf clap. You were made for that. Yeah, you were made for that. You're not going to escape worship. That's just, we come into this world and we're going to find someone or something to worship. That's just who we are. We're going to worship ourselves. We're going to worship someone else. We're going to worship a sports team. We're going to worship our job. We're going to worship money. We're going to worship looks. We're going to worship someone or something. That's simply how it is is. And sometimes it takes us time to realize, wait a minute, what am I doing worshiping, putting at the center of my life these things that can't deliver the goods? And then we come to the reality, wow, wait a minute, there's a God, a creator God, a powerful God, an all-knowing God who has made me. He's made me. I'm his People, I'm his creation. And if I'm going to figure out this one and only life that I have, I've got to get in on what it means to worship him, to joyfully worship him. I like the old British pastor Spurgeon. Here's what he said about this passage. I like this. He said, our happy God should be worshiped by a happy people. A cheerful spirit is in keeping with his nature, his acts, and the gratitude we should cherish for his mercy. Listen, God is the infinite source of everything. And yet God is transcendently above everything. God is unlimited. God is non contingent. God is God. As Scott was seeing, singing earlier, he is Yahweh. He is pure being. He is unlimited in his power. He's unlimited in his knowledge. He's unlimited in his ability to be everywhere present. He dwells in an accessible light. This is the all-powerful, 
all-knowing, unlimited, creator, triune God. He's not a small God. He's a big God. He's not a God that we can figure out totally with our minds. He is a mind-blowing God. This is who God is. Not some small provincial evangelical or some small little denominational God. No, God breaks all those moles and is way, way outside of the box. He is unlimited. And then we come into the knowledge, as this Psalm says in Psalm 100, know that he is the Lord God, that he is very God of God. And we realize he's unlimited. He's non-contingent and I'm limited and contingent. I'm dependent. He's independent. I'm very limited. You are very limited. We are limited as human beings. We're trapped inside these bodies and these minds, and we're trapped inside of time and space. And we're limited. My eyes are limited. My eyes can only see a certain distance. They're, they're limited. And if I look in the sun today, when I get outside and look at the sun and stare at the sun, my eyes will go blind. I will not be able to see. My eyes can take just so much light. They're limited. My ears are limited. Heck, my dog can hear better than I can, right? And if I hear too much sound, my eardrums will, bam, they'll burst and I will not be able to hear again. They're limited. My hands are limited. My arms can lift so much weight. They're limited. My legs are just so fast. They're limited. And my mind and my brain is limited. It cannot comprehend all knowledge at all places and all times. So this psalm bursts the reality that we have made ourselves. We have not made ourselves. We have not made this universe. We are not non-contingent. We are not unlimited. We are limited. We've been made by God himself. So there's this vast chasm between God's being and our being. It's a Grand Canyon-like chasm. Yet at the same time, if you would, paradoxically, we're still made in God's very image. Yet we are limited. We are dependent. And when we get this knowledge of God, know that the Lord is God, it humbles us. It humbles us. That there's this being, this, is, this, this reality that's far beyond anything that we can really conceive or imagine, yet we know he is there. And by God's word, we know that he actually cares for us. We are his people. His people. He made us. We didn't make ourselves. So we're not really living the good life. We're not really living the life God intended for us if we are not joyfully worshiping the one who made us. And this psalm is a, is a psalm that talks about really corporate Worship, like when we gather in here at 11 o'clock, we have already been doing it. We sing songs unto the Lord. We shout unto the Lord. We're grateful unto the Lord. But also as we leave this place and go into our cars and our homes and go into our places of work and our schools, we are to worship God by the way we live our lives. We're to put God at the center God at the center, his word at the center of our lives. All of our life can be an act of worship unto him. We were made to joyfully worship God in the way we live our lives, in the way we work, in the way we treat others, in the way we work out, in the way we pursue our arts, our hobby, all of that 
can be a reflection of worshiping God. That's Psalm 100, right? Psalm 100. Right there in the middle of the Bible. You know, I like it. They're, they're, cell phones today have those emojis on them. And I found that emojis are very helpful because I think the person that invented emojis did that to help men express emotions when they're texting. <laughs> because we stink at that. So emojis help, guys. It helps us. It helps me. And one of the emojis that I have on my phone, maybe you have on your phone, it's one that has 100 and two lines under it. 100. And 100 means keep it 100. Keep it 100, right? What does that mean? It means keep it real. Keep it authentic. So this summer, right, why don't we do that with Psalm 100? Say, hey, I'm going to keep it 100. I'm going to keep it 100. I'm going to continue to go to Psalm 100. I'm going to continue to put God at the center of my life. I'm going to worship him with gladness. I'm going to come before him. I'm going to trust in his love, his faithfulness, his goodness. I'm going to be thankful to him. I'm going to keep it 100. It's going to be 100 anyway. You might as well keep it 100, right? Let's keep it 100. And then listen, he shows us how to, uh, how to worship him. And by the way, I hate to disappoint some of you guys today, but I'm going to go stop a little bit early than I normally do because I haven't done this in a while. I don't know how much gas I have in the tank. So I know a lot of guys are like, please, can you preach longer? I'm going to preach a little shorter today. And I apologize in advance. How do we do it quickly? First of all, how do we worship God? Psalm 100 shows us. First of all, we thank him for what he has done. We thank him for what he's done. Look at what he's done. Look at this beautiful world he's given to us. Yes, it's broken. Yes, it's tough. But there's a lot of beauty in this world around us. There's a lot of beauty in nature. It's a reflection of God's gift towards us of what he has done. Look at this wonderful life that he's given to us. Listen, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know if you're looking down or looking at or looking in, but listen, if you still have a pulse, you still have a purpose, and God has a plan for your life. He's given you this wonderful life. God has given us his son, his only begotten son, to die, to rise again in our place, that we can be forgiven, that we can have new life, that we can be born again. He's given us a spirit. Man, have you ever tried to live this life without leaning and depending upon the spirit of God? It's incredibly difficult. God's given us his spirit to give us grace upon grace upon grace. God's given us the church. He's given us each other. And in our uniqueness and our differentness and our quirkiness, he's given us each other to encourage us on how we are to keep God at center and to worship him gladly. And if you're new and you look around and you think, hey, these people have it all together. Trust me, they don't. I know them. I know myself. We don't. Listen, a, a, a church as someone said, it's not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. That's what the church is. We're helping each other get well. We're helping each other put God at the center. Because people are, are, are listening to us. They're listening to us. I was reading this week a story about Paul and Silas when they were thrown into prison in Acts chapter 16 and they were thrown into the inner part of the prison and they were put in the stocks. And around midnight, Paul and Silas, they're in this horrific situation. They've been beaten up. They're thrown into prison. They're in stocks. It says in verse 16, 25 in Acts, they began to sing hymns. I wonder if they were keeping it 100. I wonder if they were singing Psalm 100. But as they were singing these hymns and worshiping God, 
in this dark time, it says the other prisoners were listening to them. Watching them. Listening them. And people are watching you. They're, they're watching me. That when we're going through difficult times, when we're going through trials, when we're going through tribulations, when we're going through suffering, are we still worshiping? Worshiping our God gladly. We worship him. How do we worship him gladly? By thanking him for what he has done for us. And, and, and we also worship him by thanking him for who he is. Who he is. The Lord is, is good. And the Lord never changes. Has the Lord been good to you? He will always be good. Has the Lord been loving to you? He will always be loving. His love doesn't run out. Has the Lord been there for you? Faithful. He will always be there for you. Because you're his. You're his people. You're his sheep. So no matter what happens, you're his. He's got you. You know, it's easy in life to lose your way. Show that. It's easy in life to lose your way. We get so busy and we get so stressed out and we get so worried and anxious. It's, it's easy to, to lose our way. Other times we're in a valley in life and things are dark and dingy and we can't see our way forward. It's easy to lose our way. Many times we fall prey to temptations and things that easily entangle us and trip us up. It's so easy in life to lose our way. What I've discovered is God's always calling us back home. He's calling us back home. This is home. This is life. This is what you're made for. Not, not to look down, not to look at and compare, not to look in, but to look up and to gladly worship the God who made you and the God who loves you and came for you and his son. That's home. That's what it means to be home, to be centered and grounded in worshiping our great God. All right. I said I'd end early, and that's where we're ending it. <laughs> Pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for pursuing us when we lose our way. God, I've lost my way so many times and you just keep gently, sometimes loudly pulling me back home. Home to making you the center of my life home to your church, home to worship the God who's made me. God, I pray for those who are here right now 
that you're calling back home to you. You're calling back home to the true center of their souls to worship you, their creator and their redeemer. God, may they stand and come down front today and say, hey, I'm coming home to him. Lord, others are already home. They know you, they're worshiping you. You're at the very center of their lives and they're simply looking for a church home, a place where they can belong and serve and grow and you're leading them to stand and come down front today and join second. God, may they stand and come and make their way down front and experience the the family and the home that you have created right here at this church. God, I pray that you would lead those who need to stand and to come down front today. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.